This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. A Delaware judge has withdrawn his approval for attorney Lucian Lincoln Lynn Wood Jr., the American attorney and, according to the New York Times, a conspiracy theorist, who has sometimes in association with Trump attorney Sidney Powell litigated on the president's behalf in many failed lawsuits which sought to prevent the certification of legally cast ballots in the presidential election. Well, the Delaware judge in a different case has withdrawn his approval for attorney Wood to represent Carter Page in Delaware court, which is not where attorney Wood is licensed. This is the pro hoc vice procedure, and you're going to see that mentioned here in the decision. So first, pro hoc vice is a Latin phrase that means for this time only, and it is the way that attorneys represent clients in courts that they're not licensed to do so. The most famous example I can give is in My Cousin Vinny, of all places. Vinny is a New York attorney, and he wants to represent his cousin in Alla Effin Bama, right, for murdering some good old boys, was the quote from the movie. And he has a meeting with a judge to try and convince the judge to allow him to represent his cousin down in Alabama. And the judge literally throws a book at him and, and tells him, you know, here's our procedures. And then half of the movie is all about Vinny messing up the procedures. Well, Linwood seems to have messed up enough that the Delaware judge withdrew the pro hoc vice approval for Linwood to appear in the Carter Page v. Oath Inc. case. This is Carter Page, who was a former foreign policy advisor to Donald Trump during the 2016 presidential campaign and who was investigated for his links to Russian officials and Russian interference during the 2016 presidential election. Well, I am not here to talk about any of that stuff. I don't know enough about it, and it's a little bit too controversial for the legal education purpose that we're trying to meet here. Instead, the purpose of today's video is to talk about this decision by Judge Craig A. Karsnitz, who has issued a memorandum opinion and order following the issuance of a rule to show cause. And that brings me to terminology number two. A rule to show cause is just a court's way of saying, the court intends to do this, show us cause why we shouldn't do this. And you'll see what this is in a moment. And the court writes, Several weeks ago, and pursuant to Delaware Superior Court Civil Rule 90.1, I issued a rule to show cause why the approval I had given to L. Lynn Wood, Esquire, to practice before this court in this case should not be revoked. Mr. Wood is not licensed to practice law in Delaware. Practicing pro hoc vice is a privilege and not a right. I respect the desire of litigants to select counsel of their choice. When out-of-state counsel is selected, however, I am required to ensure the appropriate level of integrity and competence. During the course of this litigation, a number of high-profile cases have been filed around the country challenging the presidential election. The cases included, among others, suits in Georgia, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Opinions were delivered in all of the states which were critical of the various ways of the lawyering by the proponents of the lawsuits. In the rule to show cause, I raised concerns I had after reviewing written decisions from Georgia and Wisconsin. Specifically, in Georgia, a lawsuit filed by Mr. Wood resulted in a determination that the suit was without basis in law or fact. The initial pleadings in the Wisconsin case were riddled with errors. I had concerns as listed in the rule to show cause. What in the world could the judge be talking about? Let's take a quick look, but let's not go over the entirety of those cases at what the judge might be talking about. 
In the Wisconsin case of Fian versus Wisconsin Elections Commission, Judge Pamela Pepper wrote the following four-page decision. On the morning of December 1, 2020, the plaintiffs filed a complaint, docket number one, and a motion for declaratory emergency and permanent injunctive relief, docket number two. The complaint is not verified. A verified complaint is where either the plaintiff or sometimes the attorney swears to the veracity of the contents of the complaint. The motion indicated that the specific relief the plaintiffs were requesting was laid out in an attached order. This language was highlighted and in a larger font than the rest of the motion. There was no order attached. At the end of the motion, under the words Certificate of Service, the following statement appeared, also highlighted, quote, This is to certify that I have on this day e-filed the foregoing plaintiff's motion to file affidavits under seal and for in-camera or in-person review with the clerk of court using the CMECF or, or case management system, and that I have delivered the filing to the defendants by email and FedEx at the following addresses. No addresses were listed below this statement, and no documents were filed under seal. There was no request for in-camera review. Under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 65B, a court cannot issue a temporary restraining order without written or oral notice to the adverse party or that party's attorney unless the moving party A. files an affidavit or verified complaint containing specific facts that clearly show that immediate and irreparable injury, loss, or damage will result to the movement before the adverse party has had a chance to be heard in opposition and b the movement's attorney certifies in writing any efforts made to give such notice and the reasons why notice should not be required there was no indication that the plaintiffs gave notice to the adverse parties of the morning's motion there was no affidavit filed with the motion the complaint is not verified and there was no certification from counsel about the efforts made to give notice to the adverse parties or why notice should not be required at 3.15 that afternoon, the plaintiffs filed another document. It appears on the docket as a motion to amend or correct, but the document itself is captioned, Plaintiffs Corrected Motion for Declaratory Emergency and Permanent Injunctive Relief at docket number 6. This motion indicates that the earlier motion was an inadvertently filed draft and acknowledges that the referenced proposed order had not been attached. At the end of the corrected or amended motion under the heading Certificate of Electronic Service, the motion states, pursuant to Rule 65, this is to certify that upon filing of this motion, plaintiffs will provide electronic notice to defendant of this action and motion as follows, and then it gives the email address for the Wisconsin Election Commission and defendant Governor Tony Evers. There is a proposed order attached to the afternoon's amended motion. The proposed order asks various injunctions, declarations, and orders. It does not ask for a hearing. Because the afternoon motion indicates that the plaintiffs will provide electronic notice to the adverse parties, the court does not know whether the plaintiffs have yet provided notice to the adverse parties or when they will do so. Until the plaintiffs notify the court that they have provided notice to the adverse parties, the court will not take any action because the motion does not comply with the requirements of Rule 65b. If the plaintiffs have provided notice to the adverse parties under Civil Local Rule 7b, these parties have 21 days to respond to the motion, and under Local Rule 7c, the plaintiffs have 14 days to reply. While the caption of the motion includes the words emergency and the attached proposed order seeks an expedited injunction, neither the motion nor the proposed order indicate whether the plaintiffs are asking the court to act more quickly or why. As indicated, the motion does not request a hearing. It does not propose a briefing schedule. If the plaintiffs believe an expedited briefing schedule is necessary or warranted, they may contact chambers with representatives of the adverse parties on the line and request a telephone hearing. Otherwise, the court will await the defendant's opposition brief. And that was dated the second day of December 2020. And then we turn to a different case in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia, where Ellen Wood is individually the plaintiff and is suing Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, 
And then at the end of this verified complaint, Ellen Wood Jr. verifies, pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1746, I declare and verify under plenty of perjury that the facts contained in the foregoing verified complaint for declaratory and injunctive relief are true and correct. And that's on December 18th, 2020. Now that's amusing, but he did correct that later. Of course he doesn't mean plenty of perjury, but what what the heck is that kind of typo? An autocorrect typo in a verified complaint? I, it's just not something that you do. And then in another Northern District of Georgia case, this time appearing with Sidney Powell, another attorney who has filed these election lawsuits, Lynn Wood and his team managed to misspell district in district court to different ways in the very first line of the entire matter. So when the judge in the Carter Page matter notices this, he writes, I gave Mr. Wood until January 6, 2021 to file a response. He did so at 10.09 p.m. January 6th. The response focused primarily on the fact that none of the conduct I questioned occurred in my court. The claim is factually correct. In his response, Mr. Wood writes, quote, Absent conduct that prejudicially disrupts the proceedings, trial judges have no independent jurisdiction to enforce the rules of professional conduct. End quote. Mr. Wood also tells me that it is the province of the Delaware Supreme Court to supervise the practice of law in Delaware and enforce our rules of professional conduct. With that proposition, I also have no disagreement. In my view, though, it misses the point and ignores the clear language of Rule 90.1. The response also contains the declaration of Charles Slanina, Esquire. I know Mr. Slanina, and I have the highest respect for him, especially for his work and expertise in the area of legal ethics. His declaration here focused on my lack of a role in lawyer discipline and was not helpful regarding the issue of the appropriateness and advisability of continuing pro hoc vice permission. Rule 90.1e reads in full, Withdrawal of attorneys admitted pro hoc vice shall be governed by the provisions of Rule 90b. The court may revoke a pro hoc vice admission sua sponte, which means on its own, or upon motion of a party if it determines after a hearing or other meaningful opportunity to respond that the continued admission pro hoc vice is inappropriate or inadvisable. The standard, then, I am to apply is if the continued admission would be inappropriate or inadvisable. I have no intention to litigate here or make any findings as to whether or not Mr. Wood violated other states' rules of professional conduct. I agree. That is outside my authority. It is the province of the Delaware Office of Disciplinary Counsel and ultimately the Delaware Supreme Court or their counterparts in other jurisdictions to make a factual determination as to whether Mr. Wood violated the rules of professional conduct. Thus, the cases cited by Mr. Wood are inopposite and of no avail. In Lendis LLC v. Good and Crumpler v. Superior Court of New Castle County, the courts allowed the foreign lawyer to withdraw as pro hoc vice counsel and referred alleged ethical violations to the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. Neither of those is happening here. Similar, in Kaplan v. Wyatt, Chancellor Brown, on very different facts, allowed pro hoc vice counsel to continue his representation but stressed that this did not constitute approval of his conduct and that ethical violations could be addressed elsewhere. What I am always required to do is ensure that those practicing before me are of sufficient character and conduct themselves with sufficient civility and truthfulness. Violations of rules of professional conduct are for other entities to judge based upon an appropriate record following guidelines of due process. My role here is much more limited. In response to my inquiry regarding the Georgia litigation, Mr. Wood tells me that he was only a party and the case is on appeal. He also tells me that the affidavit filed in support of the case only contained errors. Neither defense holds merit with me. As an attorney, Mr. Wood has an obligation, whether on his own or for clients, to file only cases which have a good faith basis in fact or law.
The court's finding in Georgia otherwise indicates that the Georgia case was textbook, frivolous litigation. I am also troubled that an error-ridden affidavit of an expert witness would be filed in support of Mr. Wood's case. An attorney as experienced as Mr. Wood knows expert affidavits must be reviewed in detail to ensure accuracy before filing. Failure to do so is either mendacious or incompetent. The response to the rule, to show cause, with regard to the Wisconsin complaint, calls the failings proofreading errors. Failure to certify a complaint for injunction or even serve the defendants are not proofreading errors. The complaint would not survive a law school civil procedure class. Mr. Wood, in his response, tells me that he is not responsible, as he is listed as counsel for notice. My reading of the docket is that he was one of the counsel of record for the plaintiffs, and thus fully responsible for the filing. Moreover, since I am not addressing choice of law issues with respect to professional misconduct, Delaware rules of professional conduct need not be discussed, nor am I imposing any sanctions under Delaware Superior Court civil rules. Prior to the pandemic, I watched daily counsel practice before me in a civil, ethical way to tirelessly advance the interests of their clients. It would dishonor them were I to allow this pro hoc vice order to stand. The conduct of Mr. Wood, albeit not in my jurisdiction, exhibited a toxic stew of mendacity, prevarication, and surprising incompetence. What has been shown in court decisions of our sister states satisfies me that it would be inappropriate and inadvisable to continue Mr. Wood's permission to practice before this court. I acknowledge that I preside over a small part of the legal world in a small state. However, we take pride in our bar. One final matter. A number of events have occurred since the filing of the rule to show cause. I have seen reports of tweets attributable to Mr. Wood. At least one tweet called for the arrest and execution of our vice president. Another alleged claims against the chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, which are too disgusting and outrageous to repeat. Following on top of these are the events of January 6th in our nation's capital. No doubt these tweets, and many other things, incited these riots. I am not here to litigate if Mr. Wood was ultimately the source of any incitement. I make no finding with regard to this conduct, and it does not form any part of the basis for my ruling. I reaffirm my limited role. I am revoking my order granting Lynn Wood Esquire the privilege of representing the plaintiff in this case. Given my ruling, here, the hearing scheduled for January 13th, 2021 is cancelled. Rule 90.1 requires either a hearing on the issue or other meaningful opportunity to respond. Mr. Wood was afforded the latter. My staff will contact the parties to schedule, as soon as possible, a date for argument on the defendant's motion to dismiss. It is so ordered. January 11th, 2021, Craig A. Karsnitz. What a remarkable rebuke of attorney Lynn Wood in Delaware because of what he did in other states. It goes to show that some judges will care to review the character and competency of an attorney, and actions in one place will follow those attorneys wherever they go. Attorneys need integrity and ethics to be paramount to their representing their clients at all times, and attorneys should not conduct themselves ever in a way that casts their profession and their ethics and their competency into disrepute, even if it means gaining a few points of celebrity status with your audience. The attorney is not meant to be a celebrity. It just so happens that some attorneys are revered, but the first rule of a lawyer's rules of professional conduct is a rule of competence. An attorney must be competent and must conduct themselves in a way to maintain that competence at all times. Filing frivolous lawsuits riddled with typos, unsupported by evidence, unreviewed affidavits by experts, shows that something is wrong with that attorney's practice. 
shows that something is wrong with that attorney's ethics and integrity and competency. And Judge Karsnitz is right to hold Attorney Wood to the high standard that attorneys should be held to as officers of the court. Our court system only works because of its integrity. Without integrity and trust in the court system, we would have more events of distrust like we saw on January 6th, which I also think Judge Karsnitz is right to point out the connection between fomenting distrust in the electoral system and in the court system and the incidents that happened on January 6th. In the past week, it has been reassuring to know that there are consequences for one's actions, whether it be the insurrection of January 6th or Attorney Wood's frivolous lawsuits coming back to prevent his representation in this Carter Page lawsuit. Thank you for watching. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education program here on YouTube, also on Floatplane, and on twitch.tv slash lawfulmasses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern. Our channel is community supported by your monthly financial contributions on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsors.com slash law, through YouTube membership, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Thank you to the following $50 plus supporters in the month of January. Joe Tyson, Mitchell Roten, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Heitoff, Goliath Cleric, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Besherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Hot Grills in Your Area, Torpedon, Brandon Abel, Cassandra Curran, Sovereign Titizen, Shadow Tycho, RDH Dragon, Earthbound Star, Nathan McCarty, and Awful Asses with Lemon Fresh. And thank you as well to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on your screen. I hope everyone has a great week. I will see you in the videos that drop. I love you all. Bye.